Hey, it's the analytics student. Here's part two of the Kaggle Titanic machine learning issue. We're here now talking about random forest models. So what is a random forest model? Let's take a step back first and talk about decision trees. So a decision tree is a model that has numerous branches based on making a decision or, or a difference in one specific variable. The decision tree will look at that across multiple different variables and will come up with a whole bunch of different groupings in each result or record will fit into one of those groupings. And then when it comes across a record it doesn't have a grouping for, such as something we're asking it to make a prediction of, it finds which one it fits in best by going through that decision criteria, and the outcome is the prediction. Just as a forest is a group of trees, the random forest is a group of decision trees. The random forest algorithm builds a forest of decision trees based on randomly selected data samples. This is what we mean when we said it was bootstrapped earlier. And then it uses that group to vote on the prediction. When I said before that we technically don't need to partition the data because we're using a random forest, that's why. The random forest has randomly created multiple data samples inside itself, and so a partition isn't strictly necessary, though it's still a good idea. So why should we use random forest algorithms? Well, they have a lot of strengths. First and foremost, they're probably the easiest and most adaptable model that you can use. They really are as simple to set up as I'll show you in a minute or two here. Second, it's a highly accurate model. You would think that being easy and adaptable would mean that it would need to sacrifice capability, but that's not the case. Its accuracy is actually quite good. Third, because it performs random sampling, it's robust against overfitting. Overfitting is one of the things I fear the most in statistics or modeling. Anyone who's ever worked with me has heard me say that I would rather be generally right than precisely wrong, uh, and I really believe that that's the approach that I take. Random forest fits in well with that. And fourth, it's somewhat interpretable because we can get relative feature importance. While you can't understand precisely how it delivers the prediction that it does, you understand which variables are more important than others in, in terms of making that prediction. In terms of weaknesses, the random forest only has one big one, and that's that it's a slow model to run. If you want to use large data sets or have lots of trees, every single one needs to run every time on every observation. Even if it's obvious from the start, it still needs to complete the entire process every single time. And a smaller weakness is actually also strength number four, that it's somewhat interpretable. Interpretability is a very hot topic these days in data science. Whether or not a model is good if we don't understand why it makes the predictions that it's making is a strongly debated topic. I stand pretty firmly on the side that models need to be at least slightly interpretable in order to be valuable. I've seen enough ludicrous predictions from black box models that uh, I want to understand where the prediction is coming from, even if I don't know exactly why. And so, now that we know about the random forest algorithm, time for us to build our model and see how it does. Okay, so actually building a random forest model and not. So I'm going to show you, if we use a couple of nodes to do that, I'm going to show you how to find it. Rather than going to the node repository, we're going to use this workflow coach. So the workflow coach is based on where you are. So we're not clicked on anything, so we're just giving you some random stuff. But we're going to click on partitioning, which is, remember, we got 80% coming out of this, 20% coming out of this. And the reason why you partition data is usually to, uh, to put together a model. And so for random forest, there's two different uh, nodes that we need to use for that. We need to use the learner model, and then we need to use the predictor model. So we'll drag this learner model out of here. So what learner means is it literally takes the, uh, the main portion of the data, that 80%, and it learns based off of that data. And then uh, we fill out the model that it creates into a predictor, nod, nod, uh, a predictor node, and then you know, test it on the other data. So we gotta configure this first. Um, first target column, that's what we're trying to predict. Uh, we don't care about embarked, we care about whether they survived or not. So let's see, what do we pull off of here? Passenger class, nope. Name, yeah, their name isn't gonna tell you anything. Every name is different, and um, that's, there's no way you can tell anything about that. There's no grouping if everything's different. Uh, ticket, we already said ticket numbers don't mean anything. The fare is just the proxy for uh, class, so at best you, you know, might have some uh, overfitting there. And then cabin, we're gonna pull off also, so let's see. Uh, passenger class, sex, age, siblings, parents, or children, and embarked. Okay, cool. So we're good here. So now we've now let's run that, and we get some warnings. Ah, one column were ignored due to missing domain information. So this is something interesting that um, mine does. Uh, I'm not really 100% sure, but uh, the domain is basically showing like what 
physical domain the numbers lie in. What's the min, what's the max, uh, etc. And when you fill in missing values, um, every other analysis program I can think of kind of just does it on its own. Um, but for some reason, NIME doesn't do that. So we are going to recalculate the domain. I'm just going to calculate on anything. Uh, for age, which is the one we're looking at, it says 60 possible values restrict that. I think there's more than 60 ages in there. So let's go to 120 and run it off of then. M. Actually, first, let's clear those warnings to make sure they go away. And they went away. Cool. Uh, I'm not going to go over the views right now. And so now the next up use that random uh, or use the workflow coach again and you know it'll show 88 percent likely that we're going to use a random force predictor next we are so the random force predictor is what takes the model that we created in the random force learner and then applies it to our uh, our test data so the model output is actually this one here that little square one the square goes to the square and that's how we can tell that that's the model and then the um and then we connect the 20%, which was our test, to the random force predictor. And we run that here. Um, yep, that's all good. And execute that. So let's open the view. What does the prediction output look like? OK, so it shows us um, its prediction, whether or not they survived. And then this is going to be the, uh, the confidence of that. So you'll see some pretty high ones. Uh, you know, for instance, this person right here, the prediction is that they did not survive, and it's basically certain. It's like, yeah, that guy's done. Um, and so, you know, there's, they're kind of all over the board, but you'll see the predictions are going to be above 50%. It's, you know, there's only two choices here. They died or they didn't die. And so we would expect that something, you know, with a lower prediction, you know, might be wrong, like this one, 0.59. It said that uh, Miss Ellen Nellie Barber died, but in fact, she actually survived. Um, but you know that's that's the nature of the beast. So how do we know actually how it did? And that's the score node. So the score node is going to give us some of the statistics you may have seen uh, around other machine learning stuff. So configure the score. First column prediction survived. No, we want to score it on whether or not they actually survived. And I don't care what the confidence, but I want the prediction of whether or not they actually survived. Okay. So let's run that. Execute and open views. Okay, so what do we see here? Is that we got an accuracy of 80%. So 80% means that um, looking at this is this is whether or not somebody actually survived, and this is what we predicted. So for basically, if somebody died, we were we were pretty sure that they died. We got 99 out of uh, 105 times predicted correctly that they died. If someone lived. We incorrectly predicted that they died 29 times, and we correctly predicted that they lived 45 times. Is that good? Well, I mean, it, it kind of depends. Um, in this instance, I actually think this is a little better than I was expecting. I was expecting it's something like 75%. Um, but that's how this works. And so there's a bunch of other statistics that we can go over on this. Um, so precision, precision and recall have to do with um, false positives, false negatives. Um, that's a more complicated subject, and I'll get into that into uh, in another video sometime. Uh, but our accuracy here is 80.4%. That's that's really not too bad um, for a model that took us you know, all of 10, 12 minutes to create. That's that's a win in my book.